What if there were financial solutions by brave and brilliant women, a feminist economic model? A new organization of women is realizing that woman-centered model, lifting up women activists and their real-world solutions for building an economy of our own. Ninety years ago, in a famous essay, Virginia Woolf advised a young woman writer that she needed two things, an income and a room of her own. After decades of a pay gap and big money's corruption, we need more than that today. We're creating an economy of our own. An economy of our own is creating awareness of how rigged the current economy is and how many inspiring solutions are rising because of the work of brilliant women activists. Women have been cheated and exploited by a mean economy for so long, but that's why we're in the best position to fix it together. And we're starting right now. The people who have been most excluded by that system are the ones that have the deepest understanding of what has to be transformed. It is from that knowledge that it's very important uh, for them to lead. That is leadership we absolutely have to have. Screwnomics is my word for the widely applied economic theory, I guess, that women should always work for less or even better for free. Together, we can create a living economic ecology. But to do that, we're going to need to make economics far more sexy than it is today. There are feminist economic solutions, real world fixes that are working in communities right now, communities like yours. An economy of our own is all about creating the space to lift up solutions women are advancing. We're here to celebrate women's way of knowing about money, bring you the work they're doing to shake up the system, and compile critical resources for activists like you who want to bring these kinds of changes into your own communities. Put your head together with us. It's the way we create real solutions, talking together about building an economy that works for all of us. We want an economy of our own. We want it now. And if you do too, join us today at aneconomyofourown.org. All right, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Elaine and I am so glad to have you all here. I'm going to introduce the webinar format of our evening tonight before Ricky introduces our panelists. So it's a little bit different than a Zoom meeting and all of our attendees have the option to engage with our chat feature. If you go to the bottom of your screen and click on the chat option, you can select who you would like to chat with, the panelists or all panelists and attendees. If you would like to send a message to me to ask a question about the tech features about how to do something with Zoom, you can select my name, Elaine Ball, from that list of attendees and panelists, or you can send a message to everybody. And to practice that, I'd love to ask you all to share where you are joining us from. So you can type your name into the chat and let us know where you are joining us from tonight. And that should show up to all panelists and attendees if you change who you're sending it to. Oh, uh, look at that. Now I'm noticing a lot of these are going just to the panelists. So that means that the other attendees aren't able to see where you're joining from. So make sure to change that box so that it says to panelists and attendees so everybody can see. This is exciting. We've got people <laughs> from all over Virginia and uh, I saw Cornwall. There's someone here from the United Kingdom. <laughs> oh, and from Ontario. 
in Washington State and Seattle and oh, we've got some folks here from Winooski, Vermont, land of the Abenaki. Welcome. Yes, thank you for that land acknowledgement as well. Uh huh. I'd also like to invite you all to take a poll which is going to launch on your screen so you'll be able to see a question and I believe you'll be able to select multiple choices to answer. Right, check all what that What you got. plan to do after the election next week. <laughs> And I think our panelists can answer as well. And you mm -hmm. can see in live time the percentages of other people in the webinar who are also answering. Now, the last one that says create your own op option, you can check it. But better yet, you could put in, your, uh, in the chat to everyone all other things that you might be, uh, might be doing depending on how things turn out. <laughs> Let's see. Someone's <laughs> holding her breath. <laughs> I'm laughing about holding my breath. <laughs> Possibly drinking more. Ah, dancing in the street or crying and organizing. It's hard to know. I'll either be usually relieved or completely freaking out <laughs> and getting out my Irish passport. Uh, someone is working for income equality for all. That's wonderful. Hopefully celebrating, yeah. Fighting, yeah. Either way, continuing, yeah. Possibly running for office myself. That's a wonderful idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, that was fun. So I'm going to turn off my video and let the attention be on our pal panelists. But um, if you have any tech questions, please let me know in the chat and enjoy our discussion. Can we just mention that um, that uh, Gwen Hallsmith, who is one of our board members, will also be uh, helping with chat and um, helping to direct questions and answers. And uh, that, there she is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. <laughs> Thank you, Ricky. Thank you. Also, down at the bottom panel of your screen is a Q&A option. So if you have a question that you'd like to send specifically to the panelists, um, you can click on that Q&A button and type your question in for the panelists to see. Great. Well, let's take a look at, so that we all get started on the same page, let's take a look at the uh, assumptions that we're starting with and the uh, intentions. Can we look at that slide? Oops, nope. Yeah, here we go. The assumption is that money talks in a male voice. Our systems, rules, and tools weren't inv invented by us. Slavery ended 156 years ago, but systemic racial exploitation very much remains in place. Women have always worked, uh, but only the past 50 years have most women and young mothers entered the modern job market. Women and people of color are now business owners and financial managers, yet their caring remains discounted. Economics from the Greek word oikonomia literally means household management. And that's why we think women's know-how will help change an economy that's been waged as war to one that's waging more wisely life. Growing inequality and environmental ruin tell us we can't afford more alpha male business as usual. 
and the intentions. Next slide, Elaine. There we go. Uh, to grow your economic confidence and your life waging value. Uh, we we, we uh, are drawing here on women's ways of knowing, um, which uh, have five stages of knowing and you may find yourself in any of these five stages. And it's not like you're permanently in one or the other. You start with silence and may feel like uh, you're dumb and disconnected and fearful of asking questions even. Or you may be uh, listening to voices of others in authority. Or you may be beginning to listen to your own inner voice and you're protecting it, still a little fearful. Or procedural knowledge where you're more interested in not only what people think, but how they got that to that place and where their perspectives were formed. And then constructive knowledge, which acknowledges that uh, all knowledge is built, not born. And uh, we trust your, uh, our ability to pursue knowledge by listening to diverse voices, considering contexts and collaborating while communicating with thoughts and questions and we can hold and remodel our ideas as we learn from each other. Okay, with that, uh, I'd like to inter introduce our panel. There we all are. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're so very fortunate to have these uh, four women together to uh, talk about uh, a, an issue that uh, too often gets overlooked and uh, I, I have invited them to introduce themselves and their story, the story of their journey to this passionate work that they're involved with. And um, so I'm going to just step off stage here and invite you to share those stories, uh, beginning with Martha Collins in, um, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Welcome. Thanks, Ricky. Oh, wow, um, how I began this journey. You know, oftentimes I'm asked, um, I, was, I was the one during the introductions when cheering when someone said running for office. Um, uh, I think uh, you know, not enough women run for office. And I'm always talking politics. Literally before this call tonight, me and my 13 year old son was talking politics, right? Um, that's my jam. And so someone asked, how, who politicized you? completely and totally my grandmother and my mother. As far as this journey um, and care and being concerned about caregiving or caring work, um, it goes all the way back to my great grandmother, um, a, a woman who passed before my existence, but I, I've heard the stories and, and know of her and her caregiving work and um, how that transformed into my grandmother and it transferred into my mother. So, you know, I was always told, you're not going to do this work. <laughs> you're going to go to school. You're going to do um, something else. And, and they were just so adamant about it because it was totally uh, unappreciated and underpaid work. And you, you're, you're smart. You're, you know, you're good enough, um, as they felt at times they weren't, um, which they were totally way smarter than I am, to, 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 do, to do something different. And so... Uh, for me and, and my journey, it has been looking and learning from my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother's stories and not saying, whew, I got out. Um, I, didn't, I, I never had to do caregiving work as a title, but I am a mother of two um, and still do it, to this, to do it in some form to this day. But it was, I want to see change and policy change around it. So that was really how my journey came to doing the work that I, I've done in the past um, with a number of different, different women rights organizations and just personally as Martha, the, the woman, the citizen, um, the, the, the leader of wanting to see um, something different for not only myself and the immediate women in my family, but women across the world. Can you mention the organizations that you've uh, been with? Sure. Um, so I'm the former executive director for Nine to Five here in the state of Wisconsin. It's where our headquarter office is located. And Nine to Five, yes, just like the movie. I don't know how many times I got that question. Nine to Five is the National Association of Working Women. And, you know, we are one of the most respected um, national membership groups. 
um, for women, working women here in the United States. And we were dedicated of putting women issues um, in the public agenda. Hence why I was like, yes, run sister, run. Um, you know, around issues um, that were really economic focused, right? Equal pay, um, paid sick leave, uh, you know, uh, paid sick days, um, banning the box and, and stopping forms of discrimination around um, women that were formerly incarcerated. Um, you know, sexual, sexual harassment, most sexual harassment continues to happen in this country in the workplace. Um, and so, you know, these different women issues um, over time, over, you know, like 47, almost 50 years of the existence of the organization has morphed into, you know, family issues, not just women issues. Um, you know, both men and women want equal pay. You know, every man I know has, has a mother, has a woman, a sister, um, a wife in their life that they don't want to want to be harassed on the job or paid only 80% percent, um, uh, or 80 cents on a dollar compared to a man. And, you know, I'm a woman of color, so that's even less. That's a, a white woman. Um, and, and Latino and African-American women are even less. So, you know, that organization was where, quote unquote, I, I got a title um, that was really focused on women and the women's uh, public agenda. But, you know, in, in, in my everyday life, I'm a commissioner here in the city of Milwaukee and we deal with equal rights. Um, we're very excited of the work that we've been doing with the United Nations Association, as well as Women's International League for Peace and Freedom to pass um, resolutions and legislation and ordinances on um, uh, discrimination, um, ending all forms of discrimination against women or CEDAW, um, as, as folks know it to be uh, the UN treaty from like 1979 that was not ratified, right? And so it's a long time coming. It's, it's a long time coming from my great grandmother of over a hundred plus years ago now into my mother um, and into myself and to young women after me. And I'm, I'm, I'm very honored to be here today. Thanks so much. Um, I wonder if, uh, if, if we could uh, hear from, um, from, from Patty, Patty Machesh, right? Yes, did I get it that time? Yes, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, I'm already like so inspired. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, my name is Patty Machesh. Um, I use uh, she, her pronouns. I'm first generation Polish American, hence the uh, last name. Um, I am joining you from uh, occupied Ohlone territory in Oakland, California. Um, and yeah, I think sort of what Martha was saying, I, I I think aside from my own parenting and care story, I do want to mention and thank my mother. I was raised by a single mother who was separated from her own mother when I was born um, due to uh, Poland being occupied. Um, and you know, so family separation was very real. I didn't meet my grandparents until I was a toddler. Um, and that's something that still has a big impact on our family. And we talk about it as a new parent now of a one-year-old and a four-year-old. Um, I think about that a lot. Um, what really drew me to this work was um, I was pregnant when uh, Trump uh, was elected um, or whatever <laughs> that was. Um, and uh, I was a parent of a premature, of that premature infant at the first Women's March. Um, and that just made a huge impact on me, seeing the anger all around me compared with the isolation that I was feeling at home. It really made me think like, how am I living my values? How does anyone in the world know that I'm an artist, that I'm angry about, you know, everything that's happening? Uh, and I began to think that the simplest way to communicate what I was going through as an artist was to start creating these painted time cards, which you can see um, behind me, uh, of everything that my son was doing every 15 minutes. Was he nursing? Was he crying? You know, was he crying? Was he eating? Was I changing a diaper? Uh, and it was a way that I didn't have to think, what do I make? It, it really connected my making and my work with the practice of parenting. And it was this really powerful, uh, Process. Yeah. Can we just uh, show a slide? I think Elaine has a slide of, of your work. I'd like everyone to be able to see it. It's so um, innovative. And 
I tell you what impressed impressed me was that um, there it is, invoice number zero 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 one, and you sent these invoices to official uh, officials in the state. Did you yeah, not? I did. Yeah. So the first um, the the first version of it was. Um, the first version of it was definitely to myself and to my husband, but then it got really exhilarating. I started, I downloaded an app on my phone that I could fax, um, I could start faxing these images. So I created this invoice of what would two weeks of care work look like? And I calculated with Oakland minimum wage at the time that it was about, it was like six figures. It was about like $100,000 a year if I had been getting paid for it. So I started faxing it, you know, to both houses of Congress. I sent literally like 100, 600 faxes. And it was just so exhilarating to know that I was like invading Ted Cruz's office with these, you know, faxed, paintings of care work and all of these people who it felt like were legislating and doing all of these things around me where whereas here I am feeling invisible. Um, so I think uh, I sort of imagined, well, what if other people would also start calculating this stuff? And I have to admit at this point, I did not have the knowledge of feminist economics that, um, you know, that we're going to discuss today. Uh, and it was amazing to learn about all the different existing things that had been going on. Um, so I created a website, uh, BillThePatriarchy.com, where anybody can enter how many hours a week they spend uh, taking care of others, emotional labor, uh, planning uh, trips, planning which doctor to take your kid to, um, um, you know, cleaning, transportation, and you get an invoice that you can then send. And I've heard people using these in divorce proceedings, actually sending it to exes, some of them actually getting these invoices paid, which is amazing. Um, so it's really just putting a number to it, making, making it visible, making it real in the world. Um, and from there, I think what really you know, my big lesson once I realized that um, buildapatriarchy.com was having such in uh, that people were using it so much. I mean, thousands of people have given their uh, information. I started it to kind of show how oppressed I felt. And what I learned is how much privilege I have and how much more care work people are doing than I am and with how much less help. And that's really started to make me inspired uh, to start organizing parents and thinking about if parents organized as a workforce, if we thought of ourselves as workers who are unwaged rather than people who are advocating, you know, there's so many great organizations advocating, it's always for the kids, for the kids, right? That's so important. But I'm so curious about organizing parents as, as unpaid, laborers and what that would look like. So that's the phase of the project that I'm on now and um, started earlier this year and that's the Invisible Labor Union. Um, and I'm very inspired by uh, locally, we have Parent Voices here in Oakland, which is also nationally the National Domestic Worker Alliance. Um, so there, there are huge, amazing initiatives being done all over the country right now that parents are organizing. Um, me specifically, I'm really interested in looking at that niche of uh, what if we were able to create a culture shift and change the way that we see ourselves. And I think that art um, has a special place in being able to do that, which is why I continue to make these paintings and uh, do this work. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Patty. Well, Kara, I think that's a, just a natural segue to the work that you've been doing there in Hawaii. Would you like to talk about your journey to becoming the, uh, the executive director of the Women's Commission on the Status, uh, the status of Women? I mean, I just doubled that up, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Ew, thank you so much for having me. My name is Cara Jabola Krolis. I'm the executive director at, um, of the Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women, which is a government agency across what is currently called the state of Hawaii. I um, 
I came into this role as a, um, my, my, my educational background was in law and I had previously um, studied women in economic development at the University of the Philippines. Um, so I came from more of an international frame and that's really my personal story. So my mom is an immigrant from the Philippines and my dad was in the military. So it is really um, a relationship symbolic of power imbalances um, between not just people, not just groups of people, but also of nations. And so um, for me, approaching this work, especially as a Filipina, where we're known globally as right, the Cadillacs of servitude, the Cadillacs of domestic work, we are um, very prized, although undervalued. Um, I have a lot of cognitive dissonance around the concept of domestic work and being paid for that labor. Um, you know, when we know we need to, right, dignify workers to organize them and make them feel valued and proud of what they're doing, but at the same time, knowing that um, this type of labor is a vestige of slavery and colonization and something that we don't want um, for ourselves as, as a future. Um, you know, we know the reality of even when we are paid, it's still drudgery, it is still dehumanizing in many ways, and it's still extractive. Um, so, you know, for me, I put myself through college largely um, from, from nannying, uh, from doing different forms of um, care work. It was in my family line as well. My, gra my grandmother um, cared for white children in the United States too when she was brought over and it's something I remember growing up hearing a lot of um, really, uh, a lot of complaints. <laughs> And, um, you know, about what that was like and what that made her feel like. And so I carry that all with me when I approach this work, even though, you know, we want to celebrate our role, also being really critical of this role as women's work um, and, and, and brown women's work. So that's some of my, my story that I bring here. And we, I think we're joining you because we, um, Hawaii published the very first government proposed feminist economic recovery for COVID-19. Um, we also are coming, my background is really from a Marxist-Leninist um, transnational feminist perspective. I bring that in government and show up with that in everything that I do, or at least try to. And um, I also was a fangirl of someone we have on the panel and had this book literally at my side when we were writing um, the feminist economic recovery. So shout out to you and thank you to you and all of the women here who are part of this movement and the collective of knowledge that was reflected in our in our proposal. So aloha and thank you for having us. Thank you, Kara, so much. Rianne, I think that's a perfect uh, introduction for, for you, although you, you have such a story, it's going to be hard for you to, uh, you know, condense it down. I'm, how did you get here? <laughs> Well, I have a long story because I have a long life. Uh, <laughs> but I have devoted really the last four decades uh, to, uh, you know, the, the book that you just showed, Kara, as you know, it has two chapters in it uh, called Reality Stood on Its Head. And it really discusses what happened when uh, we, for millennia, lived more in what I have called the configuration of a partnership oriented society where uh, there's more democracy in both the family and the state or tribe. Children are not terrorized into submission. Uh, where basically uh, there's gender parity so that this idea uh, of women's work and men's work, uh, you know, I mean, it's work, whether it's in the market or outside of the market and so on. And my work really, I'm thinking of it as the opposite, as standing reality right side up, <laughs> which is something that I think we're all trying to do. And I'm gonna fast forward really, because if you look at current economic systems, you know, we're talking about building an economy of our own, meaning an economy that really values the contributions of people and of nature, then we're not talking about either capitalist or socialist theory because both 
really are, well, first of all, they came out of the 1700s and 1800s and we're now in the 21st century post-industrial uh, era. But secondly, unfortunately, for both Smith and for Marx, nature was there to be exploited. There is nothing in their theories about caring for nature. And as for caring for people, starting at birth, you know, that for them was just women's work. They didn't even consider it productive. They relegated to it to reproductive. That's still taught in our economic schools. And they, that was, as, as Ricky said, it was work that was supposed to be done for free by a woman in a male controlled household. So if you want a model for economic injustice, right there, but it's a model for reality stood on its head uh, because it leaves out the three life sustaining sectors, the household economy, the volunteer community economy and the natural economy. So in my book, The Real Wealth of Nations, um, I sort of started to look at economics through the lens of what I call the partnership domination scale. And we have just launched the Make Partnerism Mainstream campaign, which is so completely aligned with an economy of our own. But economies don't arise out of a vacuum. They really arise out of the larger culture. And to the extent that we've inherited this gendered system of values that is key, central to domination systems, whether they're Eastern or Western, whether it was uh, Hitler in Germany, Stalin in the former Soviet Union, Khomeini in Iran, the Taliban, uh, right is fundamentalist allies, it doesn't matter. Uh, along with the devaluation of women, the, of the female form, comes the devaluation of anything stereotypically in domination systems associated with women or the soft or feminine. And I, I think we need to unpack that. And that's what I did in the real Wealth of Nations, which is full, of course, of practical ways, all the things you're working on, uh, Patty's, um, and, I, and I think that for one thing, we need to start thinking of work, not only as what has been paid in the market, but as the work, I mean, for economists to say that people who work from dawn to dusk, caring for the sick, for the elderly, for their children and families as economically inactive, which is what they're taught in economic school is really reality stood on its head, okay? So I'm, I, I, I mean, I have a long journey, but I wanna say something. If you think of our political, economic, of our worldview, it really marginalizes our conventional categories, right, left, religious, secular, Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, our studies of economics, our studies of society, they either marginalize or ignore the majority of humanity, women and children. That is crazy. And we need to stand reality right side up. And I don't know how much time I have, so. <laughs> That's good. We should, we should, let's, let's go and get into the uh, conversation that we uh, said we were going to have about the ways that women are made invisible. We haven't mentioned the, um, the gross domestic product yet, oh but perhaps um, those of you who registered uh, saw those um, uh, defined and, and uh, described described in, in the uh, curriculum that we sent you. Um, essentially, it's just measuring everything that adds up to money. And if it doesn't have money attached to it, it doesn't count. It does not count. So uh, you can uh, cook dinner for somebody at your restaurant and that will, call, that will count. But if you cook dinner for your own family and have a big banquet, that doesn't count unless there's money changing hands 
it, it's invisible. And that makes all of the work that Patty and Kara and uh, a lot of the work that Martha and her, her mother and grandmother were doing invisible, just didn't appear anywhere. And so there are a lot of, I mean, this has been a matter of conversation among feminist, um, feminist uh, I'm gonna call them economists, even not all of them economic degrees like Marilyn Waring, who launched things with um, her book, uh, Who Counts? Uh, pointing out what Rianne was just talking about, um, the invisibility of nature and our community and our, um, our work at home. Um, so some of the solutions you've already mentioned, Rianne, your social wealth economic indicators. So for those of us who haven't thought about that and, and the curriculum included other measures like the genuine progress indicators that we use here in Vermont, um, I think there are half a dozen states that are beginning to use those measures and then there are the uh, gross national happiness people who are organizing and trying to count uh, things that aren't generally counted. Um, um, but your social wealth economic indicators, Rianne, you've told me that um, it's different in that it's, it's giving uh, businesses and, and uh, policymakers information about the economic results, the positive economic results that come from investing in the very things that we're talking about. Well, I think you're Is that right. not right? Yes, and I, I want to say that first of all, um, we are now working on condensing what are 24 social wealth economic indicators, which we launched in 2014. And you can find out about them at centerforpartnership.org uh, into a social wealth index. Why? Because 24 indicators, that's a lot of indicators. Uh, but what is different about this approach uh, from all, well, certainly from GDP, because GDP is crazy. I mean, it's not only uh, Ricky, that it doesn't count, uh, you know, the, the most fundamental human work of caring for people and caring for nature. It includes as productive activities that actually harm and kill. You know, I mean, the salient example is uh, selling cigarettes and the resulting medical costs and funeral costs. They're all great for GDP. So our oil spills. GDP goes up because of the cleanup costs, lawsuits. Uh, so it, it, it's a mess, okay? Uh, it, <laughs> it, 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 it simply is not real, just as the stock market does not reflect, especially now. I mean, we see it writ large during the COVID-19 pandemic. It, you know, I mean, the American stock market is going great guns, except when it dips a little. But but look at what's happening to people on the ground. But the thing that's so different about the social wealth economic indicators, first of all, they take into account the economic value of the work of caring for people starting at birth and caring for nature. And you know, the fact that it's so low paid in the market and that we, as a nation in the United States, don't even have what other OECD nations have, which is paid parentally for both mothers and fathers, government supported, you know, universal health care, a lot of investment in early childhood uh, care and education. It is lunatic from purely economic perspective in our post industrial era when we keep hearing that the most important capital is what they like to call high quality human capital, you know, flexible, creative, all of these people. Well, we know from neuroscience that whether we have this quote, high quality human capital or not, largely hinges on the quality of care children receive in the first five years. My most recent book, uh, that just came out last year with Oxford University Press, Nurturing Our Humanity, 
shows the neuroscience. So for one thing, this is based on neuroscience. For another, it gives real visibility to the unpaid and unsupported, to this invisible work that we're talking about. Uh, and it is also very different in that it shows that there's a relationship between quality of life and how much investment there is in caring for people and caring for nature. So it's not coincidental that our social wealth economic indicators show that the United States has the one quarter of all children living in poverty even before the pandemic, the highest in all OECD nations, uh, highest maternal mortality, highest infant mortality, and not coincidentally invests less than half of what other OECD nations do in family support and in caring for nature. We have to start- Brian, I just, I just saw some. Yes, uh, I just saw an OECD report on investments in, in uh, child care and yes. early education and the United States of 39 countries that are members of that organization, the international organization. Where do you think we are? We're number 37 out of 39. So yeah. right at the right at the bottom of uh, of those kinds of investments. And there are those who are saying this is hurting us as an economy. Uh, it's hurting us as families and as communities, but it's also hurting us as an economy. Um, Kara, is this a is is this a good segue for for you to talk about what you discovered there in Hawaii when you uh, thought about uh, what was happening with the COVID crisis? Yeah, I, I mean, I think a lot of us in Hawaii are organizing, um, women are organizing around uh, an analysis of feminism that's decolonial and that is rooted in a completely different value system that um, Professor Eisler is describing. Um, you know, one of my favorite Filipino economists calls the GDP great disaster for the planet. And it's really, you know, what she was describing is the measurement tool of a death cult, you know, what you call a death cult in your book, because things that are life destroying have the highest value yeah. um, because they make space for more, you know, consumption and selling and profit. And so we really, the aim of our whole, our whole plan was how do we use this moment, not just to stimulate jobs or, you know, get women into the green infrastructure that's, you know, around a Green New Deal or what have you, but even bigger than that, completely shift the value system. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, and, and fundamentally change our relationship to women, because right now people are being radicalized. They're seeing, oh, wait, you know, the really the only thing holding us back is women on the front line and women in our homes right now from complete and total um, societal breakdown. And so, you know, this was an organizing moment. It was an organizing tool as much as it is a policy statement. Um, and so for us, the feminist economic recovery, you know, it laid out a blueprint for what could replace these industries of death. Hawaii is an extreme example of an economy that is lopsided, that is built around industries of war and extraction. So, you know, our, our economy is almost entirely tourism, military, and then luxury development um, and construction related to that and real estate. So for us, we've seen uh, what that looks like for women, you know, extreme precarity, a um, lot of sexual exploitation. So our bodies are really at the service of society and men um, here in a very extreme way. And so one of the things that, you know, we wanted to focus on is what would an economy based on women's needs look like? There are huge obvious um, answers to that that all of you can guess, like maternal health, you know, a whole industry around maternal care, which does not exist here at the moment, um, uh, you know, around, uh, education and childcare and health. So I won't belabor the details. I think someone threw it up in the link. Carmen, thanks so much for that in the chat. Um, but again, it was really inspired by a transformative value system approach. I love that, by the way. 
And we'll have to talk some more. <laughs> Martha, what 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 can you bring to this conversation? You're you're working with uh, in Milwaukee, where you're the center of uh, what's happening with the pandemic right now, what's happening with voter suppression, and you're working with. Uh, making food available to families in these dire times and um, must be seeing some of the essential work that uh, Cara was just talking about, that women are performing despite everything, um, that the work that isn't called productive, but which is in fact essential, right? What, what are you seeing there? Most definitely. So, you know, my day job of working, um, with the anti-hunger organization, Hunger Task Force. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, the scarcity of, around, this is the highest uh, in number of decades we've seen of unemployment. I would even say even ever of a high employment, unemployment rate across the country. And so, you know, looking at the gross uh, uh, domestic product or GDP and, and going on that type of economic model is it's, it's failing us, right? You know just solely looking at that. Um, and so you have, you know, individuals, families coming um, in need of emergency food. And we know that, you know, food scarcity is not um, an isolated thing, it's it, the intersectionality of it. So you, you add on housing um, here in Milwaukee and, and, and other parts of the, the country, folks can't afford uh, a two bedroom home on the on the salary if they were still even gainfully employed, let alone now not having any type of income coming in or being paid um, what they should be for the work that they're they're doing at a heightened level. Children aren't in school, they're home all day long, you know, and so um, women are not um, getting their fair share as it relates to definitely uh, with COVID hitting, but prior to COVID hitting. And I think Milwaukee is just a, a snapshot of so many quote unquote Milwaukee's across this country. As we were listening to the professor, you know, infant mortality, our infant mortality rates here in the city of Milwaukee is higher than third world countries. And so we know that that birth to the age of three years old is so critical, but the big part um, and why it's so high and women here and women of color is going back to the levels of stress and the, the multitasking of, you know, of everyday life and now having to go back to work too, way too soon. Um, you know, a child being a couple weeks old, but we look at other countries, um, like I believe France, for instance, they, they have that, patern that paternity leave, that maternity leave for a year. Um, whereas in our country, we fight to struggle to keep, you know, six weeks, um, Pay time off if you're if you're lucky. Um, so it's 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 real. <laughs> I, the only thing that come to my mind is real. Each and every day, I'm seeing um, you know women just keeping keeping trying to keep their households together um, in the middle of a pandemic. And so it's heartbreaking breaking um, that they're coming at the time for emergency food. We have to do food distributions. Outside, it's cold. We had our first snowfall Sunday here in Wisconsin um, with their small children with them. And we already had high numbers as an agency um, of, of people coming for, for food and assistance, but it's even, it's even higher. And so, you know, as a country, us putting all of our eggs in the basket of the GDP, we see it's not working. It hasn't been working for years. Um, and it's just even heightened now um, in current in current days and current situation. Hmm. You know, in September, I think uh, something like uh, seven hundred and fifty nine thousand women uh, were declared themselves unemployed uh, for the first time. That's an enormous uh, number just for one month. Um, so. Uh, many of those women are no doubt the sole providers for their households. And, uh, and even those who um, are not are looking at budgets that don't, that don't, don't uh, add up. So um, some of that addition that is going on with the, uh, the GDP that is um, rewarding 
really stupid policies because they make a lot of money for a few people. We also are seeing uh, an increase in the number of billionaires that we have in this country, which is another way that um, the world is kind of upside down in the way that Rianne was talking about. That's kind of crazy. Uh, and how many of those billionaires are women? So yeah. I, I see that, I see that. I see it oftentimes are uh, male and oftentimes are white. So how many of them are women and uh, how many of them are even women of color, right? Um, that are billionaires and, you know, set on our system, how are, how are they being taxed? Uh, we, we all are familiar with the famous uh, quote unquote billionaire in our country right now who paid less than a thousand dollars in taxes allegedly, right? And so, um, you know, how it's, it's, not, it's not balancing, it's not checks and balances, no pun intended. Um, yeah, and, you know, how many with the billionaires and, and everything else, um, what do they look like? And then how, how are we as a country, you know, taxing if at all, they're, they're making money and not um, paying it forward. So um, yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, you know, we've just been trying to do really social good ordinances and changes on a, on a policy level in order to impact um, or try to stop some of the impactment that's happening here locally. But we're constantly being, <laughs> um, you know, stopped or whatever. And I think that's why I used the word fight in the introduction um, because of gerrymandering and other things in our, in our city, in our state. Um, but we know we're doing the right thing because that would not be taking place um, or, or attempted if we weren't. So um, we just have to get more, you know, the, the power of storytelling. I mean, it's it's amazing. It has been amazing, even with my tenure when I was at nine to five, and I've taken that skill set over to the um, the hunger task force, the anti hunger organization I'm with now, and being able to tell those stories and having it be more relatable to some of the elected officials and just our donors and just you know stakeholders in the community. It's just folks, especially right now, I feel like can relate more to what the reality looks like. And, um, and we just been able to, to do that more. And people are more vocal in that respect. Yes, I think it has helped in that way to help make the fault lines more visible, huh? Um, Patty, I wonder uh, what you might dream of. Um, you, you've heard about uh, Rianne's social wealth economic indicators and the index that would be a number like the GDP. Um, that people could uh, refer to to measure how how well we're actually doing, um, not just the billionaires, but all of us. I wonder what you might dream about your uh, invoice and billing the patriarchy and how that might become a uh, real policy somehow. Do you have those dreams? I do, yeah. I think, I mean, I do think that it is, um, I think art, can be really helpful and powerful as an, an envisioning tool. So to help people realize that. And I, I saw somebody in the chat mention, um, you know, for uh, people, uh, you know, especially women um, aged 50 plus who are now, um, you know, caring maybe for grandkids, not finding work. Um, I, somebody on buildthepatriarchy.com, I think said that, you know, forget this last year, if they had been paid for all of the care work they'd done in their lives, they'd be millionaires, millionaires. And just that they'd never, they, that they never thought of themselves in this way, you know, as like, wow, like all of this work that I've done raising my kids, their kids, kids, the neighborhood kids, you know, all this stuff that, 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 that we do, that that has real value. Um, so to me, even though I, I understand that when we look at it from like, how do we get from the, from where we are right now to there, it seems really far away. But I also, I think what we saw is like, the US government knows how to send people money. They sent stimulus checks. If they could send a thousand dollars a week to everybody, it's not like they don't know how to do it. If we agree, I mean, and this is, again, I am an artist, I am not an economist, but if we agree that the system is made up and then we hear what Martha is saying about 
people with children in snow going to get food. Um, as a country, as a people, it is to me inhumane that we would not change the system to funnel resources, uh, you know, and I think the, I think exactly the proposal that Cara has, you know, there's a basic income supplement, uh, you know, there, um, that's things like that, sending people money, giving people health care, you, you know, just do what Cara's plan, <laughs> like, it's like, there are, or any of the other, you know, there have been so many councils on women, you know, Selma James, Silvia Federici, there's, you know, you hear about, you, you go back into history and you read about, oh my gosh, in the 80s, it, it, it seems like they got so close and what happened? And yeah, yeah. It, to me, I have this, I do have this optimism that they make it seem harder than it is. It's not that hard. Excuse my language, they're being shitty. They don't want to give up the money. It's working really well for them. That's the thing about patriarchy. It works. It's doing its job. It's working really well for them. They're making more money than ever. They're, you know, how much money did Jeff Bezos make since the pandemic started? Um, so I, I think that it is possible. I think that it, it is what, you know, Martha is saying is telling the stories, getting people angry, making them realize that they do have a voice in this. And, um, and, and it, we have a question. Yes, we have a, a question from uh, someone in the audience who wants to, wonders what uh, politicians might have, who've gotten those invoices you've sent, ha have any of them responded to you in a meaningful way? Or do they? Uh, do no, they, um, <laughs> they haven't. And I, it does look like pretty, I mean, it's, it is feminist rage hate mail. Like <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> so I, it's not like I expect it to whom it may concern, ma'am. Like, yes. Um, you know, I did get added uh, to all of their mailing lists. So now I get, so I know that they, it, wh whether somebody picked it up from the fax floor, you know, and was like, oh, what's this? Well, we pay $10 for an email address. So let's just, you know, add, add her to the here's list. Another, so. Here's another question from someone in the audience. Um, and, and maybe this is for, for Cara. How, how do you counter the argument that giving people money, healthcare, food, et cetera, is uh, socialism or communism? Sorry, I'm rereading that. Is well, first of all, who cares if you know? What, <laughs> second of all, like very recently, very recently, um, you know that system existed, and it was just our culture. Um, so that's a very, I think, like Western way of looking at it. So I would rather, um, you know, just like reframe because in Hawaii it's really unique too. Like my family's from the Philippines, like I mentioned, and we had 500 years of colonization. So women haven't been free, not to romanticize, you know, the social relations of 500 years ago either, but women haven't been free for a very long time. It's different in Hawaii, you know, just 200, you know, less than 200 years ago. I mean, women and their families still have memories of what it was like to be much freer than it is today and have a, a society that, you know, the myth of bartering, it wasn't transactional. It was a gift economy. Um, and it was about community care. So it wasn't people, you know, keeping tabs and trying to figure out, well, what's valuable for this and that and, tr and trading. It was, you know, about everybody sustaining life and being accountable to each other. So, you know, rather than socialism or con communism, I think it's really about a culture of accountability um, and survival. Um, so yeah, that's that's my take on on that one. That's great. Here's another question: Are 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 we proposing specifically monetizing care work, or are there other ways of giving care work its proper value? Well, I, I will jump in because we live in a monetized world, mm -hmm. and money is simply an economic invention. It's it's really values neutral. The issue is what values drive the rewarding of certain activities and don't reward others. Uh, I mean, what we're talking about is really whole systems change here. And I really believe 
that the gender system of values uh, is not only inhuman, but it is totally ineffective mm. uh, in terms of the world that we're living in now. It always was. I mean, see, but I, I don't look at it in terms, I look at domination economics. So to me, trickle down economics, you know, it's, it's domination economics, whether it was an, uh, you know, an, a, a Chinese emperor or a uh, Hindu uh, prince or whether it was a Muslim sheikh or whether it was a feudal lord or a king. It, it, the idea is that those on the bottom should content themselves with the scraps falling from the opulent tables of those on top. So it's top-down economics, but it's really worse than that because it really uh, discounts the life-sustaining activities of the three life-sustaining sectors. And I love what Patty is doing. I mean, uh, the issue is what kind of economic inventions, because that's all we, you know, slavery was an economic invention for domination systems, right? Uh, I mean, what kind of economic inventions can we now come up with? And it isn't just one. I mean, certainly economic inventions such as generous paid parental leave for both mothers and fathers. And as in Sweden, if in a two parent, you know, family, they don't both take it, none, neither gets it. And you know what? Men have really started to take that leave <laughs> because of that, okay? So let's design it correctly. Let's design, uh, let's change what we really allocate training and high pay for. It should be to caring work. I mean, from what we know from neuroscience, that's the most fundamental work and from what we know about global warming and climate change, that is also the most fundamental work. Uh, so we're talking about it and it's not, a, I, I really wanna say, you know, people tend to think of, that's a question of women against men or men against women. Caring is a human value. Some men are more caring than some women. I mean, I happen to be married to a wonderful caring man, but we're socialized in domination systems, you know, that for to be a real man, you can't be like a woman. So caring, caregiving, nonviolence are off, you know, off the scale. And that has to change. And I, I think we, this is the time. The COVID-19 pandemic is a time. That's why we've launched the Make Partnerism mainstream and with it a caring economics guided by the principle of does it really, whether it's a corporate charter, whether it's a government policy, uh, does it really help care for people starting in early, you know, at birth, and care for nature, or does it hinder? It's a very simple litmus test, isn't it? And that's the economics that we need right now. But for that to happen, we have to change the story. And that's really up to us. And that's why what you're doing is so important, uh, Ricky, really. And what all of you are doing is so important. Yeah, it's a great, um, been a great conversation. Um, so we need new inventions. We need new inventions. And uh, uh, we talked last time uh, in our conversation about building blocks uh, for shared economies, shared bank financing and shared, um, uh, you know, corporations, uh, businesses, uh, which involves more partnerism, right? It's, it's not assuming that there's the boss up top who's going to tell everybody what's going to happen, or there's the banker who's keeping banking hours and, and is going to decide who gets a loan and who doesn't. Um, instead, it's a more uh, cooperative, collaborative um, construction, right? Invention. That was it. I, I think that you started by talking about either life valuing or idealizing the capacity 
to dominate, to control, to destroy. And yeah. that's what the two, you know, The Chalice and the Blade, that book that uh, Kara mentioned, which was the first book, uh, now in its 57th US printing, by the way. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we need to change how people think of what is productive work. That is the central question running through all of this. How should it be rewarded in the market? What kind of training should it have? And the COVID-19 pandemic has shown that what, who are our essential workers? <laughs> you know, I mean, they're the people who care for our health, the people who care for our children, the people who provide us with food. I, I mean, these should be the rewarded activities. Mm -hmm. And uh, it should also, however, be rewarded when it's not in the market economy. Because the reason that women and children worldwide are the poorest of the poor and the mass of the poor is not just job discrimination, it's what Patty is working on so assiduously. Uh, it's because most of them are or were either part or full-time caregivers, no social security. Why? Why shouldn't there be? Mm. Retirement. I mean, we can do it, but first we have to tell, we have to turn reality right side up. Elaine, I wonder if you could uh, show us the, the um, I forget what slide it is. Is it number four that has, it's, it's Patty's um, uh, list of um, global actions. Um, next one. Yeah, that one. Continuation of a global movement. I, I, I thought this was wonderful. I, I added a few things that, that at, uh, Annie didn't know of, and probably those in the audience and in our panel could add some more too, but it's kind of a, a, a recognition of how widespread this movement has been over the years. And in 1924, Eleanor Rathbone published The Disinherited Family and established something called the Mother's Allowance in 1945. Um, that, is, uh, that was a check written only to mothers uh, written by, by the government and sent to her. Uh, Patty, that, that actually happened. <laughs> There's still a family allowance in uh, the United Kingdom, but now it's called a, a family allowance and it's, um, and it's uh, what do I uh, means tested. And then we see the civil rights and welfare movement of 68 when uh, women in poverty were organizing to include child rearing as waged work, not welfare. Again, they were receiving checks to support families, but they were saying, we earn this. You know, this is real work that we're doing. Um, in 1971, um, Maria Rosa della Costa publishes The Power of Women and the Subversion of Community in Italy. Uh, in 1975, we had a women's strike in Iceland where 90% of women just refused to perform waged or care work for a day. Imagine, that took some organizing to pull that off, but they did it. And you can see how many women are serving in the uh, Iceland's parliament these days. Uh, in 1988, Marilyn Waring, uh, whom we've already mentioned, uh, If Women Counted was her book. She was a New Zealand Minister of Parliament and uh, was critiquing the GDP's omission of women and nature. In 1998, Ecuador's constitution established unpaid domestic work. Their constitution established unpaid domestic work as productive labor. 1999, Article 88, I looked all over. I remember hearing about this and I finally found it. It's in the constitution of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, the result of a good many women organizing to recognize unpaid household work as nonprofit public service entitled to social security pensions. So it's built into their constitution. And then in 2000, Anne Crittenden wrote a book that a lot of women have um, benefited from, The Price of Motherhood, which argues the most important U.S. job is the least valued, which I think um, is, is what a lot of us are talking about. So thank you for that. Um, 
the problem, Ricky, is if you look at the academic conversation, if you look at the mainstream economic and political conversation, where is that history? Yes, where that is really it? is the problem. And, and where is it in the media? Why aren't we hearing about these things? Well, We're not that's up to us now, isn't it? And that's, but we need new language because immediately we're going to be said this is leftist or this is communist or this is no it's a caring economy and the reason that the northern european countries have done well it's they're not socialists they have a very healthy market economy they have caring policies and i think that we also have to understand that Domination economics is bad for everyone, women, men, and children. They're really, domination systems are trauma factories. <laughs> yeah, they really are. Well, ultimately- I have uh, spoken to some of that very movingly. I mean, how traumatizing it is to these children. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> And, and that poverty was there before the pandemic even. Mm -hmm. So going back to normal is not an option. We have to create a partnerist normal. I just wanted to say something to that. Yes. Um, the comment you said poverty was before the pandemic completely, right? And I saw some comments in the, um, the chat about providing folks with public assistance, maybe food stamps or some other, you know, safety net type of program. Um, but it, it's, it's a supplement. It's not enough. So these families were already coming. The line has just gotten longer. It's more people in the line. Um, but to apply for and get food stamps, um, it's not even enough. So, you know, definitely very much so traumatizing. Um, for 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 everyone, for the youth, for the adult, um, because they they don't they don't have enough to make ends meet, and now they they don't have even that that economy, the jobs to go to to try to make ends meet. But being eligible and receiving food food stamps, you're under the poverty le level line that the government set forth anyway. Income based uh, program, but it's 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 not enough. It's not enough to sustain a family of you know three, four, five people. So. Uh, why are we constantly having people jump through hoops to get the service that's not, it's not enough. It's not, it's not sustaining. So. so this is why incrementally, step by step, changing corporate charters, changing government policies, but most of everything, changing how we think about what is and is not valuable and productive. And that's our job. I wonder. Um, yes, I, I I I so agree with you, and I'm wondering about uh, what Kara was saying earlier about women of Hawaii who remembered when there was more freedom and a and a gift economy where if you needed food, it sounds like uh, come and sit down and and have a meal uh, without asking. Well. Are you eligible for this meal? <laughs> are you? Do you qualify? Um, are you poor enough to really need this meal, or are you mooching off me? So, what 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 are some of the solutions that you see for um, engendering more of that um, generosity, that um, that spirit of generosity? Well, I think that, you know, one of the more long term solutions that we're going to, to be institutionalizing uh, this legislative session um, really speaks to the brilliance of what Martha's talking about, which is organizing. And, you know, just think if we could convert everyone in government, you know, politicians are are very popular. Academics and politicians get a lot of the spotlight. But what if everybody who's, you know, designing and running and lobbying from within the government around the food stamps programs completely shifted their paradigm? What we're going to do as one solution is re mandate um, basically unlearning patriarchy. So feminist 
analysis building to every key decision maker in government. So that means the department heads, deputy directors of all state departments, all appointing authorities. So like the speaker of the house, the Senate president. So people who are deciding like who's on the boards and commissions, right? All those people don't get why we even need this. They're like climate change deniers. They deny racism, they deny systemic sexism. And so every year, you know, we hit this wall when we're trying to argue for paid family leave or equal pay or whatnot. So we're going to go right to the source. We're going to try to institutionalize that. If we don't get it, we're going to do it anyway. Um, the Commission on the Status of Women has been doing trainings on unlearning patriarchy and building empathy in government uh, for the last two years. We've done anybody from the prosecutors to um, Department of Health folks. It's really interesting as a project. And I know people wanted to hear stuff like UBI or um, different structures for uh, you know, supporting mater maternity or whatnot, but I'm just going to focus on that one and stay tuned for it. Um, I hope your states, maybe you can talk about them wherever you are, or even at the congressional level. But yeah, that's one of the mainstays for 2021. So unlearn the patriarchy. Unlearning that value system. So some people, you know, you could mainstream it by calling it like gender-based analysis training or something like that, or intersectional training or some sort of toolkit. Um, interestingly, NATO and the DOD, not the most progressive organizations, um, have these programs uh, ever since, I think around 2016, they got funded. So um, not modeling off of that though, I've, I've done that program um, and simulated it, but it's really interesting to see what's happening at the international level and how do we take that and really make it culturally relevant um, and as progressive and radical as the problems in women's lives right now and, and do it at the state level. So uh, that's we my- We have a question here from the audience is, uh, that's asking, is there a curriculum that Cara is using to teach on learning the patriarchy is that in development now yeah we've already started i mean we've we've done some of these trainings already across government like i said for the last two years um we we start with a lot of role playing and interaction and actually we spend a lot of time simulating what matriarchy would look like so that all of the um somebody's like how do you teach empathy well one of the most probably powerful exercises is what we call like a, a matriarchy simulation where all the men in the room have to experience what it would be like to be, you know, a man under matriarchy, as in like a very oppressive version of, um, you know, women's domination. And it really shakes them up and gets them clued into the rest of the two weeks. So uh, there is a way to trigger some empathy. Of course, it's a years long process. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> really, we have to change parenting too. Yes. And the normative ideal for family has yeah. to be a partnership family, not a domination family, because otherwise you're going to keep getting this denial syndrome and the in-group versus out-group thinking, really starting with the in-group of mankind and the female other, and then applying any difference, you know, whether it's racism in the US or Shia versus Sunni or Sunni versus Shia in the Middle East. It, it doesn't really matter. It's the deflection of the pain and the anger that children feel in domination families and then they vote for strongman leaders mm. because they're comfortable with it. I mean, this is why I always talk about whole systems change, but that doesn't mean that we don't do exactly what you're talking about. And I think that, yes, uh, but we need really good training, uh, not only for empathy, but for a whole new way of thinking, which is what linguistic psychologists tell us that the categories provided by a language channel our thinking. That's mm -hmm. why I pay so much attention to new categories. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, um, we're, we're, we're running out of time. And um, I want to, talking about a curriculum reminds me that uh, people who registered received a, a list of resources for further learning. You'll find uh, the organizations that we've been talking about here and others besides 
um, are there on the um, on the resources. I'm not going to show you what those look like right now, but I do want to know Elaine. Go back again. Let's let's just go back to um, yes. I just want to thank no, not that one. <laughs> The Invisible Woman. I want to just thank the wonderful um, members of our panel, and um, and I, I will hope out loud that this conversation is only just beginning, and this organizing uh, around um, changing our value system, uh, pointing out is invisible gendered values, uh, is going to continue, and uh, we'll report back and and uh, touch base with one another again. I hope. Um, I want to just um, thank you so much for, for joining us, uh, panelists, and um, I, I want to enjoy, uh, I want to <laughs> thank all of our participants for coming and for asking such great questions and being part of that conversation. And the larger conversation is really how exactly might we wage the economy as life and not endless competitive war the way it's waged now with trade wars and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it requires new inventions of the kind that uh, we, we began talking about tonight, the, um, the social wealth index and the, um, and the curriculum for uh, forgetting about or, or unlearning patriarchy. Um, we want to ask you uh, who are in the audience, what else would you, who else would you like to see in conversation, learning and sharing in a Zoom of our own in uh, 2021? We hope to have more of these conversations on related and interconnected issues that you care about. And what would an economy of our own look like for you in particular? How would it be different? In November, we're going to be uh, asking that in, in more detail and showing you ways that you can um, begin to describe for us what it looks like to you. How would it be different? Uh, we want you to write us and share with us, and uh, we'll soon be uh, filling out sending you an evaluation to, uh, to fill out. And I also want to say in November, um, we'll be sponsoring with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom a, a, a movie party, uh, watching um, a movie together, the, the Laundromat, in case you haven't seen it. So thank you all very much for joining us. Stay in touch by going to our webpage, checking out our social uh, media. Uh, we've got a newsletter. Give us your ideas, there's contact information there and donate if you can to support women's economic education and women's economic visibility, which this part, this, uh, this event was very much a part of. So um, thank you all. Um, can we go back to the panel again so we can say goodbye? Whoops, here we are. So I think it's uh, time to say good night. Um, thanks again so very, very much. Thanks to those behind the scenes who've been help helping. Uh, board members uh, Gwendolyn Hall-Smith and Mary Beth Gardam and uh, Elaine Ball, our uh, technical expert, and Carmen Rios, who's been out there tweeting to everybody about what a great conversation this was. May it be even bigger, grow larger, Thanks again so very, very much. Um, Thank, you Thank you, Ricky, for making this possible. <laughs> My pleasure so much. Bye now, Patty. Bye, bye. Bye. Elaine, Martha, bye-bye. Wonderful panelists. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, and girl with Patty. Patty, who, what's, what's the name of your baby? Uh, this is Zoe James. He's uh, almost a year, 11 months. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. Hi, Zoe. <laughs> there. Hi there. Well, hang in there. Thanks so much. Thank Rianne, so we're so honored you joined us. Oh, it's my, thank you. Really yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much. You're so close to my heart. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> <laughs>